Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop. And this episode of the podcast gets back to one of the fundamental and most talked about aspects that we continue to find as coaches. And that is, how should we train men and women differently based on how they react to different physiological stressors? And one of the lenses that we can look at this through is how are they affected differently in races? And that is the subject of this particular podcast. A recent paper was published in Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise by repeat podcast guest Nick Tiller. The title of that paper is Sex Specific Physiological Responses to Ultramarathon. Marathon. And what he and his team did for this particular paper is they looked at finishers of the Tour de Mont Blanc, time matched them between the men and the women, ran them through a battery of tests before and afterwards, and saw how men and women were affected differently, or in sometimes the same way, from the particular race. The results of which in certain areas are actually quite enlightening and may have training implications for you ultra runners out there. And so to get to the heart of the matter, I brought Nick on the podcast with one of our stellar coaches, Coach Corinne Malcolm, to discuss the results and what, if any, are the practical implementations that you all can take home and implement in your day-to-day -day training. As always, I have a lot of fun with Nick and Corinne. This one was a hoot as well because we tend to go off the rails on different pieces of banter, but we always bring it back home. We always bring it back to the most salient pieces of information that we can get from this research and how it applies to everybody out there. So with that as a backdrop, I'm getting right out of the way. Here's my conversation with Nick Tiller and coach Corinne Malcolm, all about how ultra marathon affects the sexes differently. Before we talk about ultra running, seriously, Nick, you've been killing it lately. Like, I don't know what the secret Nick Taylor sauce has been, but like every time it seems like for like the last like nine months, every time I turn around, there's something that spans both the scientific literature and the lay literature at the same time. And you've been able to weave those together um, uh, quite uh, immaculately, I would say. So k kudos to you for, for that. And I know it's just getting started. I, I appreciate the, the kind uh, the kind words and yeah you ain't seen nothing yet we, we've got a lot of stuff in the pipeline i've been working with paddy ekakakis the last 18 months two years on a series of papers and that baseless claims and pseudoscience paper is kind of the spearhead of this uh of this series of articles that we've got and and that's kind of ultimately that's that's our mo is to try and integrate the science stuff with the mainstream applied practice because the, the two things don't work. They're not mutually exclusive. They don't work independently of each other. The The mainstream health and wellness stuff influences the science, and hopefully you, you, you'd you want the science to, to impact, impact the health and the commercial industry as well. So if we, if yeah, if we're able to unify those two areas, then, then we've done our jobs properly. But no, I appreciate I, it. I love it, man. You're throwing down the gauntlet, even when you're like running at full steam. It's beautiful, man. I appreciate that about you. Um, we're going to talk about your most recent paper. And um, as you guys can tell, if you're watching the YouTube video, I'm in my van driving back from Western State still. Uh, and I, ha I actually had a thought this morning when I was trying to like think about how I wanted to articulate the intro of this. Um, when I first started coaching ultra runners, there was this theory out there that there was a certain distance at which women would outperform men in running and in, in endurance events. And the premise of that was largely a mathematical one. They just use a simple regressive analysis. They'd look at, you know, what the gap was at 100 meters, what the gap was at 400 meters, what the performance gap was at a mile, and then a marathon, and then 50K, and then 100 miles. And eventually those time gaps kind of narrowed down. And if you just extended the lines on the chart, there's some theoretical distance that the women would start outperforming the men. But my point with that is, is it was based off of race performance. And then several, several years later, and what is still starting to happen is we start to look at the physiological advantages that women might have over men in terms of what physiological traits do they have 
that could enable them to outperform men at endurance events or in ultra distance events. And now we can kind of like take it a step further to see how they were, how they are affected from ultra marathon events, comparing women to men. And we can kind of like alchemize all of those into some interesting theory. So with that as a setup, Nick, I'm, I'm going to kind of like turn it over to you for the, for the paper specifics, but that's exactly what you guys did. You took a group of women and time, ma- women and men that were all time matched and you looked at how they were affected after the ultra trail du Mont Blanc. Yeah. And just to preface the discussion of the paper. So this is, this is a collaboration that I, have had it's been ongoing for a couple of years now with the Mayo Clinic, so the team at various institutes of the Mayo Clinic across the states, and they set up this project many years before I even came on board. And they were specifically interested in how there was this interaction, this physiological interaction between ultra endurance exercise and hypoxia or altitude, and they were specifically interested in the kind of the cardiopulmonary implications of the the intersection of those two things. And so before I even came, I just wish I'd, I'd have uh, met them sooner because, uh, and I'll tell you very briefly how we met shortly, but, uh, but before I came on board, they, they went to Everest Base Camp, did a study there. They went up Kilimanjaro. They did a whole bunch of um, uh, other studies looking at, as I said, the intersection between these two areas of physiology. And just uh, it was really just to to make a scientific contribution, but because they're interested in it as well. The, the, the director there, Bruce Johnson, who's a, a legend in, in cardiopulmonary physiology at the Mayo Clinic, and he just he was very fortunate got got some grant money that he brought in, and was able to just do these things that that he was interested in. And uh, and then I met the the team at the ACSM conference in twenty. 2019, so this is pre-COVID, and I just at the time I was there presenting a paper that I'd published. There was a, a there was a couple of papers, but one of them specifically was a case study on an athlete who had done 100 peaks in the UK, and so this is basically the three peaks challenge. But he'd done the the hundred tallest peaks in the United Kingdom in I think it was 25 days. So it, it came out that he'd done an, on average a marathon every day for 25 days but uh, had, had just done this phenomenal cumulative ascent and descent over the course of the challenge. And we, we looked at the physiological implications of that. And it was, it was kind of, it was quite novel because that kind of thing had never been done before. So, and, and those guys were there presenting some of their stuff from Everest Base Camp and we just got talking. And it turns out that they had this project coming up at UTMB and they, they needed a, um, a respiratory physiologist or somebody who understood the respiratory stuff very well. And, and um, six months later, I was I was in Chamonix doing this um, doing this project. So it, it was really kind of an opportunity sample because we had this very big data set. We've got fifty five athletes from UTMB all together, males and females, and we're working on separate papers where we're discussing the kind of the more the more general physiological responses to extreme endurance and altitude. But I thought this is a wonderful opportunity to try and get some empirical data to answer this question because it goes back decades and it's been talked about and written about ad nauseum as to whether females are more robust for ultra endurance athletes. Are they going to surpass men in terms of their performances? And actually, we had some data here where we could at least start to piece the puzzle together. It's very preliminary. It's a small data set, but it is the first of its kind. And, And I think we've... I'm very pleased with this paper because we've moved the subject on in a in a meaningful way. I think, yeah. even how you know, even though it is a small sample. And describe for the listeners what things you were looking at after after they finished the race, because the the setup of the study is athletes go, they do the race, and then within two hours you start analyzing all of these different parameters. Why don't we kind of like walk through what each one of those were and maybe some of the highlights that were more impactful in your opinion? Sure. So for the people who haven't read the paper, as I said, we had 55 total athletes. Of those, only 10 were female. So that's roughly in line with what you'd expect in in an ultra-endurance race of this distance. Somewhere between 10 and 20% of the field are usually female. 
And so we had 10 female finishers, uh, 10 females, two of them didn't finish, or one of them didn't finish, one of them didn't return for their post-race assessment. So we had eight and we time matched them with, with eight male athletes. So we had a group of eight females and eight males. They came in the week before the race to do a bunch of physiological assessments. And then they came in on average, I think it was an hour and 40 minutes after the race to, to repeat their measures. So we looked at a whole bunch of different things. We did some basic kind of um, anthropometry. So we looked at, at body mass. We took some vital signs, which included uh, resting heart rate and took their blood pressure, more just kind of for the basic health status. And we were interested in whether that changed, but it was more really just to make sure that they, that they were in reasonable shape and w could progress through the study. We took some blood samples and we looked at all types of different biomarkers. So we, we looked first at electrolyte concentration, sodium, potassium, chloride, and uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit. So as, uh, as an indication of um, sort of red blood cell count or red blood cell destruction, uh, plasma volume as well. So we, we calculated plasma, plasma volume from the hemoglobin and hematocrit. And then in terms of biomarkers, we looked at two markers that were specific, more or less specific to cardiac function. I don't want to say cardiac damage because it's disputed as to whether these markers actually reflect damage of the myocardium, but we, but it was um, cardiac troponin and, uh, and BNP. And then we looked at muscle damage uh, with uh, CKMB and then renal function or kidney function with creatinine. So these, these are all the markers in the blood. And then we did a whole bunch of different cardiopulmonary measures, or it, I guess it was more specific to the respiratory system. So we did basic spirometry where we get data on their overall lung function. So how much air can they move in and out of the lungs? If that is diminished in any way, it, it, can, uh, it, it can reflect sometimes if there's some kind of airway obstruction or if there is uh, some kind of inflammation in the airway that is preventing the efficient movement of air in and out of the lungs. We look to airway resistance through a, uh, a special method called uh, impulse oscillometry. So that without going into the detail, it basically uses sound waves and re reverberates sound waves up and down the airways. And it gives us a pretty good in indication as to whether there's uh, airway an increase or decrease in airway resistance. And, we looked at gas transfer as well, so diffusing capacity. So obviously the, the main function of the respiratory system is to move oxygen from the atmosphere into the blood. And when at rest, most healthy people can do that pretty efficiently, but following exercise, particularly extreme exercise, the ability to move oxygen through the alveoli in the lungs can be diminished. So we were interested to see how the race and, and the altitude and the interaction between the two affected the athlete's ability to move oxygen through the lungs. And then the other key thing that we looked at here was what we call lung comet tails. So this is a, lung comet tails reflect the amount of fluid accumulation in the lungs, or it's more commonly known as pulmonary edema. So pulmonary edema is fluid, fluid accumulation in the lungs, and that in turn can affect lung function, and it can have some really major clinical implications as well. And we did that um, using a tr what we call a transthoracic ultrasound. So it was uh, an ultrasound probe that was looking between the um, through the rib cage between the um, be between the various ribs, and we looked specifically at the lungs. And we we can look at cardiac function as well. So what happens to the pumping capacity of the heart pre and post race? So that's a, a very quick whirlwind tour of the things that we looked at. There were a few other things that are probably not worth mentioning at this point, but it was a really comprehensive kind of physiological assessment. And it gives us a, a pretty good indication as to what's going on, into, especially in terms of the cardiopulmonary function. With any, within any of those that you just mentioned, are there any ones of those that you would describe as like heavier hitters than the other ones in terms of we know when we see dysfunction here and it shows up in a biomarker or the physiological assessment or whatever we know when we see this type of dysfunction we know that that person is going to their performance is going to get impacted more so than anything else yeah good question because a lot of these things a lot of these measures are taken and they're supposed to reflect one thing but actually when you look at the literature it's a little bit dubious 
to say the least. So, yeah. for example, I mentioned uh, earlier that if, when we look at these markers of cardiac damage, quote unquote damage, yeah. uh, so cardiac troponin and BMP, th- this seems to be, we saw the really large elevations in markers of cardiac, quote unquote, damage following the race. But actually, if you look at the literature, these markers are increased following almost any type of exercise, any high intensity yeah. exercise, yeah. marathon running, ultra running. There's been a bunch of studies looking at this specifically following Western states, which we were talking about a few minutes ago. And it's quite normal and not necessarily clinically meaningful that you would see, see increases yeah. in these things. I don't think it should just be ignored and we, we shouldn't just assume that it's that, that there's nothing wrong with it. I think we need to do a little bit more research in understanding what the chronic implications are of repeatedly elevating cardiac biomarkers. There might be long-term implications of periodically seeing spikes in these, but certainly it's not not necessarily clinically meaningful, certainly following a race of this type. Now, if somebody who was otherwise healthy came into the emergency room and they had elevated cardiac troponin without any other cause, then that could be, in, that's indication probably of heart damage and there's, there's some kind of underlying cardiac issue. But in this context, it's quite normal for these things to be elevated following an extreme distance race. So those things are kind of fairly normal. It's obviously expected that you'd see large increases in muscle, uh, in markers of muscle damage. So CKMB is, is always elevated following races. But interestingly, it seems to be more elevated following ultra running than following marathon running. So that there are two things that might increase damage of the skeletal muscles. It would be high intensity running, so running quickly or running slowly for a very long period of time. And typically you see much higher concentrations of, of markers of muscle damage following ultra than you do in marathon than you do in 10Ks, for example. So ultra seems to have, but that, and again, that's kind of intuitive. To answer your question, the, the big hit hitters, so to speak, for me in this study are the cardiopulmonary measures that we've that we've taken because these things are not ha- haven't been assessed so frequently. And typically the, the studies that have looked at lung function following marathon and ultra marathon running have looked at basic spirometry. So how much air can you move in and out of the lungs in a single breath, which is interesting and it tells you a little bit about the lung function. But in terms of the lungs diffusing capacity, so its ability to transfer oxygen, that's that's fairly novel following a race of this type. And also the transthoracic ultrasound that tells us about pulmonary edema, because that's not that's not been commonly looked at following ultra endurance exercise. And again, the the interaction between ultra endurance and hypoxia, because that tells us a little bit about what's going a lot going on in terms of lung inflammation. So those are kind of the novel aspects and those are the things that we'd want to focus on more closely. Well, and that's one of the things that the paper pointed out kind of most directly and we'll we'll skip we'll, we'll, we'll kind of skip directly to the lung diffusion capacity piece, which I think is a really interesting one. And this is one this is an aspect that declined more in males than it did in females and also has a uh, what you would you what you would call a clinically significant outcome but i would call a performance significant outcome if we're looking at how it actually affects people's performance but let's back up a little bit cuz most of the listeners aren't going to kind of understand how we how you actually assess that so within that particular test just walk through what it looks like before and afterwards and then what the actual results were in terms of what you guys found for these athletes that had just done UTMB. Okay, so measuring it is really simple. We measure it using what we call the single breath technique. So the the hemoglobin in the blood have this have the, the main role of carrying oxygen. So you you take a breath in, your lungs diffuse oxygen if they're working effectively through the alveoli in the lungs. And then the oxygen is, is transported in the blood to the various tissues and muscles of the body. So in terms of performance, everybody is familiar with VO2 max. And VO2 max is primarily determined by how much oxygen you can deliver to the muscles. The, the ability of the muscle to take in oxygen isn't really a limiting factor. The, the most kind of limiting factor or the rate limiting step in terms of maximal oxygen uptake for performance is how much oxygen you can deliver. So... And, and that's usually cardiac output. So it's the pumping capacity of the heart and how much hemoglobin you have in the blood 
But if yeah. that if something is is reducing the lung's ability to diffuse oxygen into the blood to begin with, then that's obviously going to have an impact on performance. If there's less drive for oxygen through the lungs into the blood, there's less oxygen available to transport to the muscles to begin with. So that's why exercising at altitude, it typically diminishes your aerobic capacity and diminishes your ability to exercise at a high intensity because there's less drive for oxygen into the blood. So so going back to your question, so we, we measure this with the single breath technique. And rather than measuring how much oxygen is diffused through the lungs, we look at carbon monoxide because the hemoglobin in the blood have a, have a very high affinity for carbon monoxide. In fact, the, the hemoglobin in your blood would prefer to transport carbon monoxide over transporting oxygen. It actually, carbon monoxide binds more easily to, to hemoglobin in the blood. That's why carbon monoxide poisoning is so deadly and, and it's so easily um, it's so easy for these things to cause so many clinical problems because your your hemoglobin would much would much more readily bind to carbon monoxide and if it's doing that it's not carrying oxygen right so people essentially as, asphyxiate and so but so we use a very 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 tiny concentration of carbon monoxide that doesn't have any clinical impact on the body and we get the individual to take a deep breath in all the way up to the total lung capacity. So they breathe in as deeply as they possibly can. And we have a, a known concentration of carbon monoxide in this breath in. So they're breathing through a mouthpiece and they're breathing mostly room air, but there's a tiny concentration of carbon monoxide in there. They hold their breath for about 10 seconds and then they slowly, slowly breathe out. And we look at the discrepancy between the carbon monoxide concentration that's, that's breathed in and the amount that's breathed out. And then that tells us the the gas transfer capacity or the diffusing capacity that the lungs have for carbon monoxide. It gives us a pretty good indication as to how effectively the lung is, is able to transport uh, gas. In this case, it's a surrogate for oxygen. And so you're comparing before race and after race and seeing exactly, yeah. what that and seeing what that deterioration is, and there's deterioration in both groups but the men yeah. deteriorated more than the women. And here's what yeah. I want to, here's what I don't understand that you might be able to illuminate for Corinne and I from a clinical standpoint. What was that deterioration? And can we put that into like, a, like some sort of context? Like it is, the, the deterioration itself is, is clinically meaningful or meaningful to performance to what degree? Is there anything that we can say about that? So in terms of what we found, there were we, we looked at DLCO, so diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide, and DLNO, diffusing, diffusing capacity for nitric oxide, and females didn't show any statistically significant change pre to post race. There was a, a slight kind of reduction when we look at the the results. Uh, I'm just looking at the the kind of the spreadsheet that we published here, and you know. You, you could say it's approaching something statistically significant, but but generally there was no. If we you live by the sword, you die by the sword. There was no change in females, whereas males did exhibit this large statistically significant reduction in both values, and there were large effect sizes as well in the males. So the effect size is the magnitude of the change. We don't just look at whether it's statistically significant, because that's only that only tells you if if it's you know there could be some kind of statistical artifact or statistical noise or chance and something could come out statistically significant but when we look at the magnitude of the change looking at the effect size the males had a pretty large effect size as well so so for dlco so the diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide it was um it dropped from 34 in males pre-race to 29 and that was uh, statistically significant and had a large effect size. So 0.83, that's a Cohen's D. So people who understand statistics and effect size, that's, that's pretty big. That's a big drop. Yeah. And we saw that we saw the same for DLNO. And, um, and, and I think it's, it's worth mentioning the, the, the pulmonary edema that we saw here as well, because it, it's, there's a good, indication that when we see pulmonary edema or fluid accumulation in the lungs that could in turn affect diffusing capacity and and again in this case we saw a, a, a very small 
decrease um, in in um, sorry a small de- increase in uh, polymer edema in the females, but a, a very large increase in the males. And again, the, the effect size in in females was 0.96, which is which is pretty big. In the males, it was 2.4, which is colossal. So, the, yeah. so we see this v- not just statistically significant, but a very big effect size in the males. So so we're seeing a much more prominent fluid accumulation on, uh, in the lungs with the male athletes. So it, in terms of clinically, whether it's clinically meaningful or whether it affects performance, that's a difficult question to answer because probably in this case, in, in most individuals, it, it wasn't clinically meaningful. Nobody had to be hospitalized because of this. Nobody needed any kind of medical in- intervention following the race even though these are quite novel findings, we've not seen this before, there's a good chance that it would impact performance because if if it's reducing your ability to transfer gas across the lungs or if it's causing some kind of respiratory symptoms, that's going to affect race performance. So in the athletes that we typically see, and we've got a couple of case studies that we're going to pull from the data set, a couple of athletes that we see who have the biggest increases in fluid accumulation on the lungs they have this kind of crackling noise when they breathe. Yeah. They have this really marked marked increase in respiratory symptoms. They feel breathless and uh, all kinds of distressing respiratory symptoms. And that in turn is going to affect performance. And in, in a couple of these athletes, we do see clinically meaningful decreases in lung function that, that would suggest to us that actually we need to monitor these guys and it's, I don't know when you get to the point where you pull them from the race. I don't, I'm not sure if um, if there's kind of a, a threshold that you'd have to cross, but certainly, yeah, it can be clinically meaningful and almost certainly affects race performance. Can I pose a question just because I'm really curious here about, um, you know, the simpler the simpler mode of examining this, which doesn't really get to doesn't get to the heart of what you guys were able to see is that is that forced expiratory volume. And you note that that seemed to decrease more in women, which which makes sense to me. Women have even in size matched individuals, women would have smaller, smaller total lung capacity, smaller lungs from an anatomical standpoint. They like at the same rate of exertion, they have to breathe more because they have smaller lungs. And so I'm like just kind of baffled that while we see a drop there in women that seems to be larger than in their male cohorts. Like, how does that not translate to right. women ending up with more pulmonary edema in a in a time matched race setting like this? Like that to me is just like very curious, and I don't know that we have an answer, but that's like exactly like where my where my brain is going with it. Yeah, super interesting question, and you you rightly point out that that in general what we saw is that when we look at the what we call them the the spirometry measures. So again, for people who are not familiar with the measures, you get your athlete to take a deep breath in and then they breathe out as hard and as fast as they can for as long as they can and it gives us an indication as to not just how much air they can move in and out of the lungs so their lung capacity but how quickly they can do it so it gives us an idea as to the flow rate if flow rate is reduced then it could be because there's some kind of airway uh, obstruction that's limiting airflow in the same way that if you if you get a, a hose that's spraying out water and you compress the if you squeeze the hose somewhere up the line then the water is going to start trickling out at a slower rate it's exactly the same with airflow and so and, and in fact airflow is considered to be you know when, when you study airflow it's fluid dynamics it's all kind of the same f- physical principles and as you you're absolutely right Corinne that Women tend to have smaller lungs. They have slightly narrower airways, and they tend to be more predisposed to airflow limitation for various reasons than males. And that's kind of what we saw here in terms of, uh, so so we see this decrease in lung capacity pre and post race in, in women, but not men. And when we look at things like flow rates, the, the decrease in peak flow, the amount of air flow that could be generated pre to post race, there was a bigger drop in females. But again, going back to my point about whether this was clinically meaningful, it wasn't. Even though that the decrease was bigger in women, actually there was there was no meaningful change. There was no clinically meaningful change in either group, and um, th- this it probably wasn't because of some kind of airway obstruction because. The advantage, is, or the advantage of looking at these more mechanistic measures uh, 
uh, that we have here is that we can get to the root of what's causing the change in lung function. And we can say with some confidence that there wasn't any airway obstruction. There wasn't um, you know, anything that was obstructing airflow in either group. And so we can almost consider the change in lung function and the change in diffusing capacity as two separate entities. Now, what's causing the, the, the diffusing capacity, we can only speculate. We, it might be something to do with um, the capillary recruitment in the lung, so pulmonary capillary recruitment. There might be a difference between males and females there. But really, we, you know, we don't know what kind of phenotype is specific to males and females that would cause the males to have much more pronounced decreases in diffusing capacity. And we don't know what may be protecting females uh, against this kind of pre to post race decrease in diffusing capacity. It's really sort of up in the air. We need more research to look at the you know, genetic determinants of that. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask is what sort of sex specific physiology would you theorize is responsible for the discrepancy that you're seeing? And, you know, it seems like this is just one of those things where it might be left up to theory at this point. Yeah, it's all theory because, the, you know, when you look at something that we've that we know a little bit more about, like the musculoskeletal responses, we we see that females, generally, I'm saying females rather than women for, I don't know if the reasons are necessarily obvious, but but females are the, the correct term here. When we look at the, the female responses in terms of the muscul musculoskeletal markers, there is a, a smaller increase in CKMB. So we can say that females experience less muscle damage. And that might be intuitive because there's plenty of data showing that females actually tend to be more fatigue resistant in the yeah. in the skeletal muscles. And lots of great research done by our good friend Guy Millet from University of St. Etienne. And you know, the, his lab has shown a bunch of different times that, that females are probably more fatigue resistant over long, long periods of time. And that might have some kind of role in protecting females from large increases in in markers of muscle damage, but in terms of the lung function stuff, we we really don't know. It's it's it's, it's pure speculation at this point. We're we're seeing all we can say really with our study, and again, it's a small study, and it's one of the I think it's pretty much the only study of its kind at the moment in, in this kind of uh, looking at sex differences in this kind of event. We can say that females experienced no significant changes in lung diffusion capacity, whereas males absolutely did. And it was a not just significant, but it was a large change as well. And we can say that males had a much uh, greater uh, increase in, in pulmonary edema, but we don't really know what's causing it. That there, yeah. there are some kind of um, there's some kind of male there's some kind of sex difference in the phenotype that needs to be studied uh, more closely, but, but we can only speculate as to what that might be. He, here's what I extrapolate a little bit from it when when I kind of like look at it through a performance lens is when I see the kind of the insults that the males displayed across the entire range of them. I can look at that and say, okay, if we were to do like a graded exercise test before and afterwards and just isolate those variables, that's probably worth several points. You know, somebody has a VO2 max of 60, it's reduced to 52 or 50 or something like that, so several points. When I look at it on the female side, it's, it's kind of trivial. It's maybe a few points, right? And you see that play out mainly in like clinical populations, right, where they have some sort of pulmonary edema. They do a Bruce protocol, graded exercise test before and afterwards. You see that, you know, that, that what I'm calling a performance deterioration kind of show up. Now, we know that ultramarathon performance, and if your colleague Guy has really done a good job at anything, he's done a good job illustrating this. We know that ultramarathon performance is multifactorial, but at least on the cardiopulmonary side, when I try to bring it out into like realistic, very pragmatic terms, that end function or that end performance function, I really do boil it down to something that would that would show up on something like a performance test, a graded exercise test, or a time to exhaustion test, where you can actually see those see those differences play out. 
Yeah, and if you were to, so one of the limitations of our study is that we weren't able to quantify kind of yeah. cardiorespiratory fitness or any kind of performance measures. I know Gies done some stuff on, on this in, in the past, and actually it's funny because when we were when we were doing our data collection, Guy and his in his lab were actually in a, an adjacent room, so we were we had two different projects going on at the same time in the same facility. Um, and, and it was fascinating seeing the kind of stuff that they were doing as well. And he was getting his, his subjects, they, they finished the race and they had to do these maximal sprint efforts. So he so was getting mean. to see how it, so how, mean. Yeah, it was awful. I don't know how he recruited any, any, I mean, he did, he did. I, he's, he's, I mean, he knows the race very well. He knows the race directors and he probably knows the athletes well. So I think that kind of works in his, in his favor, but uh, he, he was getting them to do these maximal exercise protocols, and I just I can't imagine. I had trouble getting people to, to stay conscious just doing lung function. <laughs> Literally, one of these guys breathed into a tube and then was on the floor, and I, and, uh, and I had to you know co- co- coax him round, and I got him through the, the the test, which is one of my prouder moments. But yeah, so we, we weren't able to quantify cardiorespiratory fitness, and if we were able to do that, that some kind of performance test. All of these things that I've described, differences in lung diffusing capacity, the skeletal muscle, the skeletal muscle uh, biomarkers, and certainly the pulmonary edema would, 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 if it's affecting gas transfer, would affect their ability to take in and utilize oxygen. But I think what, what, what we need to try and move towards, and I think we're a long way away from doing it, and, there are, there are some models that have tried to do this, but we need to try and create some kind of fully integrated holistic model of ultra endurance performance yeah. where we have these different factors. We try and get an understanding of the magnitude of each kind of physiological uh, system and how that might influence performance. And we can, you know, if we could plug in all of these different factors, and and um, it's probably going to be different for males and females, which is which is an added complication, and it's probably and and I think that's more so in ultra than in other types of sports. So I think we're a long way from doing that, but hopefully having an understanding of the kind of physiological changes that we've seen in this study, we, we might be able to at some point plug in some of these numbers into that some kind of. Uh, comprehensive model when you were doing some of the um some of the research to kind of get ready for this project were you aware of anything similar at some shorter distances even in other sports that took kind of the same these these same things that you were comparing across and if you found those could you kind of like generalize what the differences were in those shorter you know those shorter events versus what you actually see in ultra marathon there's quite a lot of stuff done in marathon running, and the problem is that, as we know, ultra is such a unique sport. It's not just long marathon. There are so many additional things to think about. It's so so multifactorial and dynamic, and there are so many things, so many physiological systems that are affected in ultra that are not necessarily affected in marathon. And I think the the danger is that we're too ready to extrapolate the studies yeah. from marathon. And and that marathon is the closest comparator we have, right? And and it really doesn't tell us almost anything about ultra endurance physiology. And so I think if anything, extrapolating research from marathon running or shorter distance races or even triathlon, it, it hinders rather than helps our understanding of ultra. We've got to look at this with a fresh set of eyes. We've got to empty our cups, so to speak, to to quote a Bruce Lee term. And so. That, that, I mean, a bunch of stuff has, has been done looking at you know, changes in cardiac function speci- and looking specifically at skeletal muscle function, contractile fatigue in the skeletal muscles. But I, I'm just I'm not sure how much it really informs our understanding of, of ultra endurance physiology, which is why we, we've got so much research in ultra and yet there's still so much we don't know because it's really difficult to try and get this integrated model Um because it's really it's only been studied for the last couple of decades and i've alluded to this before unfortunately i would say the majority of research that's done in ultra is research for the sake of research it's big data stuff or it's not very mechanistic yeah. it doesn't really move our understanding forward in any meaningful way this is the first study that's that's been done on this area and i would say that this is one of the most impactful studies looking at sex differences and yet this is at best this is preliminary data of two groups of eight people you know, and and I, 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 we fully acknowledge the limitations of this study, and yet it's probably the the most meaningful study we have in this area 
um, or that's been published in a long time. So that can, that tells you about the state of the literature here. Well, we're a long way off from that integrated model. I don't, I don't want to sound like a party pooper or anything like that because I'm I, I'm going to be the first one that you know starts to adopt pieces of that integrated model as something that I very first wanted when or I wanted something close to that at least when I very first started coaching, just to give me a little bit of framework. Um, I wanted to ask more as a cheeky question than anything else. Have you had anybody reach out to you and start like spiking the football in terms of, you know, women are better than men in this just because of this study? Or is that just something that we're, we've gotten so used to that people aren't so quick to jump to that conclusion yet? Yeah, a bunch of people have reached out recently for more for mainstream media stuff. I mean, this has been written about so many times. Right. In the mainstream media, that we, we wrote a review paper a year or so ago it, that was published in Sports Medicine called um, "Do Sex Differences in Physiology Confer a Female Advantage in Ultra Endurance Sport?" And within that, we cited I think six different media outlets that have basically published the same. They've all they've all written about the same thing that they've posed the question: Do do women make better ultra endurance? athletes than men but of course they're not approaching it as an open question they've already yeah. they, they they it's a it's pretty much a close-ended question they already know what they're going to write about yeah. and they go into it with this narrative of well yes and and then some of them one of them was um the, the title was why women are better ultra marathon runners than men yeah yeah and then it did this very <laughs> cursory overview a very simplistic <laughs> analysis and so that one of the things that's the inspired me to write that paper was because it's been written about so many times in in the media and they've done such a rubbish job of doing it so this is something that has been argued for decades it's going to be continued uh, it, it's going to continue to be argued and I think it's important to stress here that we didn't go into this with any kind of pre-existing expectation I didn't want to find a specific outcome I didn't know what I was going to find. It was just an opportunity to look at the data and at least try and fit one of the puzzle pieces into place. Let's look at the data. Yeah. Let's see what we find. The statistics here are as robust as we can get the statistics, given our small sample sizes. And um, and the, the data show what they show overall. When we look at all of these different variables, males have more frequent physiological perturbations pre to post race. And the magnitude of the change is bigger in males as well. So when you look at the effect size, the pool, the effect size is 0.86 for, for men and 0.63 for women. So this is a moderate effect of the, the race on physiology in women and a large effect in men. Th that's it. That's what we found. As I said, the statistics are robust. I'm, I'm pleased with the way it's put together. And that's that's all we can say about it. So it, and we it can is what stop it is. there. Yeah, it is what yeah, it is. You don't, you like, you don't like it. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you want me to say. <laughs> it is what it um, is. Corinne, I kind of th these are so this is something where I have a hard honestly not to like diminish the study, Nick. It's freaking awesome, but I have a hard time pulling out the practical points from a from a coaching perspective. That's my role in lot in life. So I'm going to lean on Corinne and kind of put her on the spot since I can't come up with something very good for it. Is there anything that you pull from this, Karen, where you're like, okay, from a coaching perspective or in the way that we um, kind of manage athletes during or after a race where you look at this and go, oh, okay, I, I, I might think about this little, I might think about this a little bit differently or something that you can pass on to athletes? I don't know that we have any like this is a try and true guideline that can that's coming out of this data right now, right? Maybe with more like longitudinal studies down the road. I, I, like, I think that what was highlighted here is that we don't know the extent of what an acute, what acute damage is done from, you know, one big UTMB style race, right? Like we don't, we don't understand those implications yet. And, and maybe there's nothing there, but you know, you could, you could look at this edema issue, for example, and even if it's not, they're not presenting clinical symptoms, um, what does that look like over time? Like, what does that acute race damage look like over time? And does that give us a, I don't know, does that provide more caution to, to us as coaches who have athletes that really want to do 600s this year, for example, yeah. and like maybe that's not yeah. a good thing. And maybe we can use this as a cautionary tale to say, Hey, we don't know, like maybe like, let's try to <clears throat> meter the excitement there or whatever it is. But I don't think it's like, okay, this is what we know happens. And this is, 
this is, you know, what the data is showing. I think we we hear stories. I mean, Tahoe 200 is a example of this from the respiratory side of things. Like they had a lot of athletes drop out of Tahoe 200 this year. It's really dusty. It was super cold overnight, citing respiratory issues. They were having issues breathing. It was kind of that acute, acute um, restriction more than likely or obstruction um, with some of these athletes. But we see that at Hard Rock. Actually, medical directors at Hard Rock yeah. talked about that. They call it the Hard Rock hack. These high altitude generally overnight um, or higher altitude, I'll say, overnight races seem to elicit this respiratory issue in athletes who might have no clinical past with asthma or exercise-induced bronchioconstriction or some other sort of laryngeal obstruction issue. And so to me, it's like, okay, maybe that means when I have an athlete going into a race like that, we talk about that medical history. We make sure that there's nothing there that we want to be, that we're concerned about. Um, I've got another athlete who just went and like is seeing his physician to maybe have a rescue inhaler prescribed because this has happened at a couple yeah. races now in an acute sense. And so I don't think we're getting instruction out of the, out of the research yet, but I do think if anything, it provides a, a, a we're less naive about potential outcomes from like a clinical and medical sense. And I think that that maybe is the take home message for people is like, we love the sport, but you know, there, there's a dose response here to certain things. And maybe that can meter some of our excitement of, uh, how many, how many of these, uh, acute, I don't know, body slams we're willing to take each season. Um, how many insults do you, longer. yeah. How yeah, many insults do you want to, yeah. 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 I was going to say gold star take her and Nick, you go ahead. Well, I just, I agree 100%. And there were just two things that I wanted to add on to that. That the first is that the one thing that we absolutely can't do with this paper is say anything to the effect of uh, females uh, are um, less likely to have you know cl- negative clinical responses following ultra. Yeah. So focus on the on the males. That would be the you know an extreme take, and it's not helpful because th- as I, as I've said, we've got to understand the limitations of of these data, and every athlete is different. As we know, some people are, are more susceptible to acute physiological changes so every athlete has to be managed on on an individual basis and i don't think that we should be anticipating uh, more serious or less serious responses based on sex i think that would be very very unhelpful the other thing uh, that that karina um, mentioned was that i think this should be used as a as a platform if it's a springboard to consider the long-term effects so yeah. so we, we've known for a while that that running Ultra marathons, particularly if you're going to do like a hundred miler or something, it has a, this acute physiological effect on the body. People t- seem to recover within a couple of weeks. Most of their values return to baseline within a week or so. But what are the long-term effects of periodically slamming the body in this way? I, I don't think we, we, there's enough data now to say I, I'm pretty confident that extreme exercise training probably isn't bad for you. And we spoke about this before, I think. Yeah. In that exercising for, you know, 20, 25, 30 hours a week doesn't seem to have any increased risk of cardiovascular disease or increased risk of mortality. But what I'm concerned about is that going out and running for 24 hours, 48 hours, two, three, four, five, six times a year, I'm worried about what that effect on the body will be. So, you know, it, we had good athletes here and the average finish time was... Uh, you know, 30 hours or something uh, at UTMB. I mean, the the winners are like low 20s, but good athletes are going to take a lot longer than 24 hours and, and doing that three, four, five times a year. And I, and, and I just think we've, we've got to be a little bit more careful about that. But you know, the one thing that I want to mention before I forget is the, is the elephant in the room that a lot of people have, have not even noticed. The invisible elephant in the room is that the data that we have here and the data that we look at with regards to sex differences in ultra endurance responses is not necessarily representative of the average human because 80 to 90% of the people who run ultra marathons and the people who are studied are male. Now that doesn't mean that the 10% of female athletes necessarily represent the female athletic population. They're probably self-selecting. This is speculation, I don't know this, but I suspect that the type of women who are entering 100 mile races, knowing full well what the risks are, how extreme it is, knowing full well that 80 to 90% of the field, field are male, 
they're probably self-selecting as the toughest, most robust, most, um, you know, most badass females uh, among female athletes. They're not just, they probably don't represent female athletes. They're, 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 I, they're, I, su- I suspect that they're, they're exceptionally tough female athletes. So I think we've got to be very careful looking at data sets like this, you know, when only 10% of the field are, are female and saying that, that this group represents female athletes mm. because they probably don't. Now, it's different when you look at marathon running because 45 to 50% of marathon runners are female, right? It's a developed but field, here, yeah. It's a developed field here. Yeah. Any given ultra marathon race is only 10, 15 percent yeah. female. They probably don't represent female athletes as a whole. So we've got to be very careful about mm. how we extrapolate these kind of data. Yeah, you could probably well, get closer with like a hundred k or a fifty miler because as we, it's it's as you go up in distance that you see less female participation, and then part of that is like the the selecting in of like if I think I can finish it under the cutoff time, I am more likely to start the race, and you see that more so in the female field than you do in the in the male field and so i mean it tracks it makes sense to me why why even anecdotally selective even think anecdotally and i hate to bring an anecdote because the the plural plural of anecdote is not data but every you know i know a lot of male ultra marathon runners who are like in decent shape and can get around an ultra and they may be carrying a bit of extra weight and you know whatever every female ultra runner i know is a badass (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, and I, maybe that's just, I know that's, that's only my own perception, but like you, you don't, you very rarely see like, uh, you know, an out of shape, not very robust, not very determined female ultra marathon runner. I'm like, is that just me? No, that's not just you. I was thinking the same thing. I, the, <laughs> the, the percentage of like the really badass females compared to like the total pool of females is way, 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 way higher than it is on the men's side. Way higher. So this self-selection, Nick, I, I never thought about that, but I'm totally with you. And I'll also throw in that the, that cohort, right, females running ultra marathons, is likely to change dramatically over the course of the next few and several years. And when you have that expanding, you know, population, you're going to get a more diverse, da- you're going to get a more diverse u- user group. And so your point of not necessarily extrapolating it, I think, is really is really well taken, because as that user group gets more and more diverse, the results that you will likely find are probably going to be less homogenous. Yeah. And like we, sure. we know right now that like like we, we, we follow this kind of every time there's a big race. I haven't I haven't crunched the numbers yet for Western states, but overwhelmingly men will pull themselves and the 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 participants in the women's race get either timed out if they if they DNF or have a medical DNF, and it's, it's so there's this interesting psychology there between the two fields where men will be like, I think I'm good actually, like I'm gonna stop now, and women are like, I missed the cutoff by a minute, and that's why I didn't get to continue. So there's this interesting like, yeah. how do they select into the DNF pool is very very different across the fields. And, and even looking at a, a race like Western States, which is, you know, one of, the, one of the toughest, the oldest and one of the toughest 100 milers you can do, you have to qualify. So even those, even that athlete group are self-selecting as, yeah. as the, yep. the best ultra runners in the world. So that, that's even less, uh, that's even more homogenous, less heterogeneous. So again, we've got to consider all of these things when we're weighing up the, the data that we have on this sport. Well, and once again, I think that's kind of why why UTMB presents one of the it, one of the best opportunities to gather those athletes because you typically have a more diversified set of athletes. Um, you can do it across multiple races, kind of in a similar or the same type of uh, type of environment. And there's just more people. I mean, let's face it, you know, there's 2000 people in each of the races, there's 10,000 athletes out there total. And, uh, you know, when you're looking at, you know, Western States or kind of whatever it is, you and you move from a few hundred to several thousand. That's not trivial. That's why you and Guy can be like in adjacent rooms and still have, you know, successful, you know, research studies being done, because there's just such a there's just such a huge core cohort of people to pull from. There was a little bit of tugging of jerseys <laughs> in mean, our room coming but uh for the most part we got on we got on and uh yeah we, we were able to split the cohort yeah 
So are you gonna are you going to in the future, Nick? Are you going to expand upon this in a little bit more of a robust fashion? To you mentioned this is the kind of a first of its kind deal. What do you want to look at next? So we have a bunch of data from that particular study that we that is that is in the works. So we have a series of papers looking at different aspects of pulmonary function with the larger data set. As I said at the start, we have 55 athletes in total, and we have a bunch of data also from the Hong Kong 100 as well. And we're sort of going to merge the data sets and look and, and try and pick out to see if there's a difference in the athletes who were exposed to the altitude um, and, and and try and get to the, the bottom of some of those questions. So we have a series of studies in, in that area. In terms of trying to develop this study, looking at sex differences, there are no plans to do that at the moment because this study was, the, the data were collected over two years of the race. So the, the group attended UTMB in 2018 and 2019, but pre-COVID obviously, and, and we were able to get 55 athletes through our testing protocol. And when it came down to it, we had eight females only. So, so, and, and the, the, you know, this was a, a costly trip. We were out, we were in yeah. Chamonix for three weeks. We were all physically exhausted at the end. Uh, it was, it was a, a real kind of, uh, it was a gargantuan effort to get this data set together over two years of the race. And we still only got eight female athletes. So how we are going to expand on this kind of study, I don't know. There, there are no plans to at the moment if an opportunity presents itself or if somebody is listening who wants to give us some funding to to look at this then hey that 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 would be wonderful but um this as i said this is kind of the 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 biggest data set of its kind at the moment given all of its limitations so yeah how how we move forward from here we don't know but 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 in terms of the larger data set we've got a series of different physiological systems that we're going to try and isolate and contribute to our understanding of ultra endurance physiology. I always appreciate your context that you put things in. Like sometimes you always run the risk of like presenting a nothing burger, you know, when you do that, because they can be so benign and you add all the caveats and things like that. But, you know, it's always made way better than over sensationalizing what the, what the results are. So I, I do hope that you get an opportunity to continue to explore this because, at the end of the day, I think both on the clinical side and on the performance side of things, we all serve to have a little bit more knowledge in this area because it is so new and it's so novel. And we're in a, in a lot of ways, we were off air, we were talking about some of the medical practices that we've seen at uh, some of these ultra marathons. That's going to continue to evolve as well, just because, you know, for all with all due respect to those early practitioners, they're just kind of guessing and making up what they think the best run a show should be. And things like this help tailor those practices down to the ones that are going to be the most helpful for athletes, both from a performance perspective and then also for a, from a health and wellness perspective. I think that's really important because one study very rarely changes practice. You know, it's it an accumulation of studies yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, it takes a lot of research to reach a scientific consensus on anything. What we can say is that our study is novel it's uh, interesting and it adds, you know, as I've said, another piece to the puzzle, but it's a big puzzle and there are a lot of pieces to fill in. And the worst thing that we can do is overstate our findings. Everybody wants answers. Everybody yeah. wants to understand, you know, humans need, need answers to things. But the worst thing that we can do is fill in the blanks with, you know, made up data or, or um, you know, pure speculation. All that does is hold us back. So we've got to be, we've got to be honest and say, look, the data is here. It says this. Uh, let's see what else we can find, and then over time we'll we'll get a, we'll improve our understanding. But overstating it, that your results is just that doesn't help anyone. Yeah, this was fun, you guys. Karen, do you have anything to tack on before we say goodbye? You had the best take, no. by the way. You always have the best no, I'm take. Just, I'm upset that in the show notes you said that we could start talking about when I was going to start beating you in races, and we never never got to talk to that. Oh, well, so. okay. Here we go. When are you going to start beating? You already can't beat me in races, so that debate is already settled. <laughs> well, I think, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to end up at a race, because I think you and I try to avoid racing when our athletes are racing, and so we're going to end up at some really weird race together, and then we'll get to finally, because I don't think we've been, we've done the same races, but not the same years. I think at this point. And so it's going to, it's going to all line up 
and we're going to actually have a or have to put a wager on the line when it does happen. We definitely will. And then Nick can stop doing research because that will definitively solve all of all, all of our questions, answer everything. Answer. Just just in that end of one experience no, right no there. No pressure. It'll be yeah. <laughs> can who, I write who, who is this more a case study? The, yeah, the, 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 his, the history of all ultramarathon research will be contingent upon the result of that singular it's event. Probably it's going to take something <laughs> very minor and very obscure for one of you to get an edge. Like, you know, it'll rain the night before and the one who's better at running in the mud, you know, yeah. T- typically in, 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 in uh, like in California that people are just not very good at running uh, when it rains. And I did the, the uh, Ray Miller 50 a few years ago. And it had been uh, it had been raining the week before the race, and typically Californians are not good at running on anything other than dry dirt, and the, the course was muddy. And I'm like from England, uh, this is my wheelhouse. This is this is where I shine. Everyone else is slipping over, and I'm just like flying along. Out I think performing. I finished sick in that race. Yeah, for sure. I was overtaking people who were slipping over, and I finished sick in that race. <laughs> Um, just, yeah. just purely as a as a byproduct of it being wet on the course. It was yeah, it's like it's how so I'm good. the only person that was upset in 2019 when Western states was cooler than average. I was like, no, 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 mm. crank the heat, this make is, it as unbearable as possible. This is my wheelhouse. Yeah. All right, Nick. Thanks for coming on the podcast again, man. You're definitely a serial offender, and there's a reason for that. All the guests appreciate when you uh, come on. How? Uh, first off, I'll leave links in the show notes to the paper itself, but. How can the listeners find more of your work? We alluded to this at the very beginning of the podcast. You're kind of like everywhere now, and I'm losing track. So I'm going to have to take notes and put them in the show notes as well. But where can they find more of your work? Yeah, I've got a lot going on, but you can find all of my work in Ultra, in in uh, critical thinking, skepticism, science research on my website, which is nbtiller.com. You can find me on Twitter at nbtiller, tweet about all of that stuff. And uh, yeah, watch this space. We've got a lot of cool stuff going on. So um, maybe I can come back on the podcast sometime soon and discuss it with you. I can't wait because that's the juicy stuff that everybody gets so fired up about and I get all the angry emails afterwards. So we'll, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely do that when we come back on. You probably get it more than me, but still. <laughs> hey, this is fun as, right. it's fun as always. Thanks for having yeah, I'll, me. I'll, awesome, man. Thanks, you guys. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Nick for coming back on the podcast, explaining his research and what it might mean for athletes. But more importantly, Nick, thank you for all the incredible content that you have produced over the last several months. It has been amazing, as we talked about from the onset of this podcast. Everybody listening right now, go to the show notes, find all the links where you can follow Nick Tiller and go and follow him. You will be well served and your training and racing will be better because of it. Thank you to Corinne Malcolm for coming back on the podcast. And as you always do, helping to explain what the results and what the meaning is of some of the scientific research is in terms of how athletes can apply it day to day. You have an incredible gift of doing that and you just get better and better at doing it every time I have an interaction with you. Most importantly, Thank you to the listeners out there. And this is a very this is a very special, most importantly on this one. I know I always say that, but this one has particular meaning. That is because the Coopcast has surpassed 1 million downloads recently. In fact, I have a sneaking suspicion that while we were recording this very podcast, that 1 million download mark got obliterated. And I am humbled. And I am absolutely honored that so many people have spent so much time listening to this podcast. And I hope that it has better informed everybody's training and everybody's racing. And if you happen to be a coach, your coaching practice as well. And so to celebrate that, to give something back to all of the listeners and particularly the hardcore listeners that are out there that are listening to this long rambling outro, I'm just gonna give stuff away for free. What I'm gonna do is if you go to my website, jasoncoop.com forward slash book, and you choose either the hardback version or the paperback version, I will send you a free copy with the promo code COOPCAST. It's COOP spelled with a K, all in caps. That is my gift to you. I'm not gonna spam you afterwards. I'm not gonna charge you for shipping. I'm not gonna charge you for anything. Just go to the website, click on the book link, order a book, send it to yourself, send it to a friend, send it to family, send it to one of your training partners, send it to somebody as a stocking stuffer for Christmas. It's gotta be a big stocking because the book's pretty big. 
No matter how you want to use it, I just want to give it away for free to people. Just as a thank you for everybody out there listening and for all the awesome comments that I receive on social media and in person. Like I said, I'm absolutely humbled that this podcast has seen this much success. So that is my gift to you guys. Giving my book away for free. I'll sign every single one of them. Go to the website and find it. Promo code Coopcast, all one word, all in caps. That is it for today, folks. Here's to the first million downloads and here's to several million more in the future. As always, we will see you out on the trails.